So welcome, everybody. Uh, Tana and I are so excited today to have one of our friends, Dr. Mark Houston. And if I read everything about him, we would take up the whole podcast. Uh, (laughs) He's an assistant clinical professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University. He's also a clinical instructor at George Washington University. Tana and I met him at uh, A4M. Uh, where he is in charge of the uh, cardiovascular modules, uh, which is a place that both Tan and I have taught. He's selected as one of the top physicians in hypertension in the United States, selected as one of the most influential doctors in the U.S. in both hypertension and lipidemia. Uh, I mean, it could go on and on. He's the author of over 250 medical articles, scientific abstracts, and seven best-selling books, including uh, one of my favorite books, It's What Your Doctor May Not Tell You uh, About Heart Disease. So, Mark, we, we are grateful and honored to have you with us. We, we really Thank are, you. Mark. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I just want to say one thing really quickly to uh, just on a personal note about Dr. Houston was we did meet you at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. I think I actually got to meet you first because I was attending one of your classes, one of your modules. And um, I love your modules because you have this very no-nonsense approach, which might imagine I like very much. So <laughs> so it was really interesting. And I just think you have some great information. I'm really excited to have you share with our people because there's a lot of myths out there. So we're excited to have you share that. So this Thanks is the first of four podcasts. And we are going to talk about how critical your heart and blood vessels uh, and fat are to the health of your brain. Uh so, so, Mark, let's get right to it. And when, when we talk about the heart-brain connection, what are the things you think our listeners should know? I think the most important thing is to realize that uh, there's a, an immediate direct connection that's bidirectional between the heart and the brain. And you really cannot dissociate these two organs in any way. They're interrelated intimately in virtually every process related to brain health or heart health. And and, and there's two big mechanisms by which that occurs. One, which is obvious, which is the neural connections. Everybody understands that one, you know, related to heart rate and heart rate variability and heart rate recovery time and all that. The one that people don't really know about or think about is this new concept of the immunological directions between the brain and the heart. Um, And we can get into this more detail, but just to set the stage for, I think, your audience, there is actually direct neural connections on T cells. There are direct receptors on T cells and and indirectly on B cells that determine a instantaneous response to whatever is going on in the brain to the immunological system and therefore sets off an autoimmune reaction, literally. Uh, both in the heart, in the vascular system, but also backwards, perhaps in the brain, which is tied into this whole concept of inflammation, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. Right. We're going to talk about that next because it is one of the major risk factors of Alzheimer's disease and depression. Yeah, so interesting. So when I was a nurse, I worked in a trauma neurosurgical ICU unit. So I had the pleasure of working with both (laughs) cardiothoracic surgeons and neurosurgeons. And there was always this sort of you know, I want to call it in fun, but it wasn't always in fun. This little turf war over what was more important, the pump or the computer, (laughs) right? But in truth, they're connected, right? We can't disconnect them. And I think that, um, I don't know if that's been your experience, but I think we could do a better job of working together and really paying attention to the fact that we're one system um, and not disconnecting that. And and now we know that, you know, I mean, we have to really be looking at both, both aspects. Yeah, you make a great point, and the, the, the new catchword for that, of course, is uh, systems biology, and we realize this is uh, even more than spokes in a wheel, the interconnections are enormous uh, in relationships, not between every organ, just uh, the heart and the brain we're talking about today, but they are very important, and, you know, luckily, most of the people that you and I uh, associate with have got that connection down there, we don't have the turf right. wars as much. Right. 
So for a long time, I, I've talked about whatever is good for your heart is good for your brain. And whatever's bad for your heart is bad for your brain because your brain uses 20% of the blood flow in your body. And then I read this study from uh, Boston University uh, and I went, oh my goodness, whatever's good for your heart is good for your brain is good for your genitals because it's about <laughs> blood flow. And whatever's bad for your heart is bad for your brain is bad for your genitals. And you have to wonder, why is Cialis commercials and Vi Viagra commercials on TV so much? And the study said 40% of 40-year-olds had erectile dysfunction and 70% of 70-year-olds have erectile dysfunction. And what that made me think is probably 40% of 40-year-olds have heart dysfunction or vascular dysfunction and brain dysfunction. So to, to get people really interested about what we're talking about is it can affect your sexual function, your overall well-being, your heart, because if it's not right, nothing's right, and how you think and the so decisions that you make, which is your brain. So if I just heard you correctly, you think you're going to get people more interested by talking about their sexual function? Absolutely. <laughs> See, okay. Well, I think everybody will be up for this story. <laughs> <laughs> but you make a great point, and that is, uh, I mean, it's, it's related to to blood flow, which uh, is more more or less endothelial function, which ties into nitric oxide by availability. So one of the parameters that that we use in the Hypertension Institute in Nashville is ED equal ED. That is endothelial dysfunction ah. is erectile dysfunction. Oh. And if you ask a man, does he have erectile dysfunction? It's almost 100% correlation with endothelial dysfunction because the nitric oxide levels in the penile arteries are very low. Erections are very uh, improbable uh, or they, they don't happen at all. And it's tied directly to testing that you can do for nitric oxide in our office. Oh, so interesting. And so important. Uh, I learned about the heart-brain connection in a very sad way. So I'm named after my grandfather. He was my best friend growing up. And, but he was a candy maker. And so he was overweight. And he had his first heart attack at 49. But when he got his second one, he got depressed. And that's when I was in medical school and I learned about the connection between heart attacks and depression. Can, can you talk about that connection and what you've seen over your career? Absolutely. Um, most traumatic events, uh, whether it's a heart attack or someone that goes on bypass graft or even a stent, part of it, part of it's just the stress of the event. Part of it is if you have surgery, this is no surprise. It's the anesthesia that just absolutely destroys your brain for, for a long, long time. But if you just talk about the heart attack issue, um, there's a lot of different uh, cytokines. These are chemicals that cause inflammation all over the body. And when you have that much heart damage, you are inflamed for a long period of time. So what that does, it sets off instantaneous inflammation in the brain which then sets off this depressive mood affecting your neurotransmitters. And the other part of it is just the inability to perform your normal activities. So people get depressed because they have to change their diet, they have to change their activity level, uh, they have to stay at home more, uh, they're depressed because of other things that they can't do, the normal activity. So it's a complex issue, but Depression is almost universal after a myocardial infarction, and it can last for a long time. I've had people still depressed a year after their heart attack unless they get some help. Oh, interesting. So if I'm hearing you, just to recap this for our listeners, because this is a question we get a lot, um, people don't understand. So anesthesia from almost any surgery, bypass surgery, definitely, we see that a lot Also with increases the risk of dementia. Right. And heart attacks increase your risk of depression, but you can get help. You should get help if, if you're going through that. Well, and what I really like is the connection with inflammation. And so if you can be on an anti-inflammatory diet, uh, that can be really helpful. What about omega-3 fatty acids? And people, um, we often measure um, 
someone's omega-3 index here, uh, a test developed by my friend Bill Harris. And they're Bill usually Harris. terrible. Um, Oh, I, I did f- 50 consecutive patients who came to Amen Clinics that were not on fish oil supplements. 49 of them were suboptimal. Uh, I mean, it's shocking to me how, how much it was. And, and, and it's sort of a simple fix. Well, the omega-3s are essential for brain and heart health. There's an amazing study, it's a meta-analysis, just published about two weeks ago from Mayo Clinic Proceedings, reviewed something like 600,000 patients that were on high omega-3 diets or omega-3 supplements. And there was no question at all that depending on the dose, depending on a lot of other factors, there's a huge reduction in both primary and secondary prevention of coronary heart disease and myocardial infarction. So that's one of the top supplements that I use. And you're right, here in Nashville, uh, if you're not taking a supplement, people that are eating their normal sad diet are the ones who have very low omega-3 indexes. And I, I like your population, I don't see normal omega-3 indexes unless I've already put them on an omega-3 supplement right. and they come back for checks. So do you tend to use a higher, like, what what you what would you consider to be a normal dose that you put people on? I start with a range depending on the clinical problem I'm trying to address. So if it's a prevention and a healthy person, you can get by with about maybe one to two grams of DHA and EPA per day. But if you've got a patient who's had a myocardial infarction, bypass graft, PCTA with a stent, known coronary heart disease, angina or some other cardiovascular problem like hypertension or dyslipidemia, or maybe even diabetes, they're going to go up to high doses of about five grams a day of a DHA and EPA. And I usually put it in with GLA, which prevents a depletion on the two sides of the chain, and also a gamma delta tocopherol, which prevents the oxidation of the omega-3s in the cell membrane, which is absolutely crucial. So that's like a type of E, right? They would find that like over with E vitamins? Yeah, yeah, there, you know, there's eight forms of vitamin E, and this is the gamma delta tocopherol, which is the one that's actually used most commonly by humans. We don't actually have that much of the alpha tocopherol in our diet. Um, but that's when all the studies have been done with. Right. That's why we get mixed results. So it was when I listened to your uh, your lecture that I that I really changed my intake of my fish oil and added those other two, the GLA and the gamma delta um, took off roll. So th- I just want so, people to so hear this that. is a what this brings up to me is a really important point, and okay. and that is if someone has heart disease, they are often also on a blood thinner. And common wisdom among physicians is if you're on a blood thinner, don't take omega-3. Which I have been told. What, how would you respond to that? I have been asked that question many times. I've actually looked in the literature for an answer, and I had the answer. It does not significantly increase the risk of any major bleeding event and you can be on aspirin, you can be on Plavix, you can be on Berlenta or Eliquis or any of these new factor 10 inhibitors. And yeah, you may bruise a little bit more, but as far as GI bleeding or hemorrhagic strokes or any other typical major bleed, there is no significant increase in risk. And in fact, if you put people on omega-3 fatty acids, either after a heart attack or after a bypass graft or after a stent, you reduce the secondary heart attack significantly, you decrease stent restenosis, and you decrease bypass graft restenosis. Wow. We actually have a program that we use. It's a combination of omega-3s with high-dose curcumin before, during, and after surgery. Sometimes I can't tell the cardiothoracic surgeon that I have them on either of those two supplements because they get all bent out of right. shape about whether well, they're going to bleed. So, uh, but we've been able to show dramatic results using those two together. So, so just to be so clear, curcumin is another one we love for the brain. We're running out of time for t- let me just for this recap one. that one thing for people. So, what I heard you say is they might have bruising for superficial type treatments or or whatever, but they're not going to cause bleeding, like significant any type of blood thinning. That's correct. Got it. So important. 
uh, stay with us. We're going to come back with Dr. Mark Houston. We're going to talk about inflammation. Pick up his book, What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Heart Disease. And also, Mark, tell them uh, your website that people can learn more about your work. Yeah, it's a pretty simple one. Hypertensioninstitute.com. Hypertensioninstitute.com. Stay with us here at the Brain Warriors Way. <laughs> 